Hi there, everybody. Um, welcome to the Geological Society's ninth public lecture of the year. Uh, my name is Megan O'Donnell, and I'm a policy and outreach officer here at the Society. Um, throughout 2019, the Society has been making the year of, marking the year of carbon through a series of conferences, lectures, and educational events. Today's lecture will explore the link between volcanic activity and the carbon cycle. Tamsin Mather, a professor at the University of Oxford, will tell us about volcanoes and past climate, adventures with deep carbon. Volcanoes have shaped our planet since the beginning. Volcanic eruptions can help support life, for instance, by providing nutrients like phosphorus or iron. But they can also be deadly natural hazards and have been implicated in some of the greatest mass extinctions in Earth's history. Tamsin will tell us how studying volcanic gases and rocks from modern volcanoes can provide insights into the drivers of long-term climate change and the causes of some of the most profound environmental changes in geological history. Tamsin is a professor of earth sciences at the University of Oxford, where she's been on the faculty since 2006. After completing a PhD on the atmospheric chemistry of volcanic plumes, Tamsin's research broadened to explore the many ways in which volcanoes interact with the environment and the hazards that volcanoes can pose. Tamsin also serves on the Science Committee of the Natural Environment Research Council. Please join me in welcoming Tamsin to the stage. Well, thank you very much, uh, and thank you very much, all of you, for attending the very first talk I've ever given that's been billed as a matinee. So I, I'm very excited about this. The last time I went to a matinee, I think it was a pantomime. So I'm uh, very much hoping that uh, we won't have uh, any shenanigans uh, during this, uh, this talk today. <laughs> I was hoping someone would say that. <laughs> no, we won't. Um, <laughs> So today I'm going to talk to you about volcanoes um, and past climate and take you on some adventures with deep carbon. And I'm going to start off with an image. So this is uh, one of, many, of my many favourite images of volcanic activity. So this is the, uh, uh, an image from the uh, 2010 Ayafat Yerkut volcanic eruption in Iceland. Uh, I like to start with this image because it reminds us of our intimate connection here in even the relatively benign tectonic backwater of the United Kingdom um, with, with volcanic activity. And I'd wager that there were uh, at least several people in this room whose travel plans were disrupted by this, uh, this volcanic activity. Um, my, uh, my, my, my uh, holiday plans were actually disrupted in an entirely different way. I was on maternity leave when this eruption went on. <coughs> and we booked in some family holiday, um, and the phone didn't stop ringing with journalists wanting, us to, wanting me to go on television to talk about the, uh, the, vol the Icelandic volcano, as they came to talk, call it, because they, none of them could, uh, could actually get their, their teeth around this, uh, this word here. And it must be absolutely terrifying to see this word come up on your teleprompt, mustn't it? <laughs> um, and, if you, uh, and if you ever get a bored moment, uh, I'm sure you don't, but uh, do have a look. There's a wonderful YouTube assembly of all the newsreaders around the world trying to say, I felt a year cut. Uh, and eventually they all just decide to call it the Icelandic volcano, which of course is deeply non-descriptive because there are a lot of volcanoes in Iceland. Anyway, this reminds us of uh, volcanoes and volcanic hazards. Unfortunately, no one was, uh, was killed in, this, uh, in this, this instance here. And actually, it wasn't even a very big eruption. But it reminds us the reason that we had that disruption was because planes were grounded because of the risk to human life. Um, but Iceland is also a country that gets a very large percentage of its power through geothermal energy. So I also think this image is a good illustration to remind us that while volcanoes are hazards, they can also be real resources. And I'm going to touch on some of the work we've been doing in East Africa during this talk, just touch on it. But actually part of the driving force of that has really been about thinking about how to help countries like Ethiopia or to do the underpinning science that helps countries like Ethiopia to harness the geothermal potential of their volcanoes and to make clean, relatively clean power in that manner. Um, but then the third reason I really like this image is because of this, uh, this arc of volcanic lightning you can see there. And that is generated by the volcano itself. It's not by chance that it's there. Uh, I like this not just because it asks, answers a really vital question, which is how can you make uh, a volcanic plume, a photo of volcanic plume even more spectacular? The answer is put some volcanic lightning in it. Um, 
But it also reminds us, as, uh, as Megan already alluded to, about the important role volcanoes have played in shaping our planet. And actually, this bolt of volcanic lightning here is one of the several candidates for uh, creating, synthesizing the very first molecules of life. So volcanoes have really played a key role in, as a planetary process in terms of forming our habitable planet that we all, uh, we all enjoy today. Um, so what I'm going to do in this talk really is to sort of start off with thinking about how volcanoes hit the news and then really going off into deep time and, and thinking about deep carbon in the context of volcanoes. And one of the things I really hope to also bring across is how... Uh, my job today, sort of sitting on the edge of volcanoes or tramping through the landscape in East Africa uh, and making measurements of our present-day planet can actually inform our understanding of what's gone on in the, in the deep past of our planet's history. So just starting off with, uh, with, with volcanoes in the news, and hopefully I can bring out, use this to bring out some different styles of volcanic activity that we have on the planet today. I already talked about the Icelandic volcano, Eifat Jökull. That's not a perfect pronunciation, but it's uh, better than some. And, and, of course, the travel chaos that caused. And that was because of this plume of ash coming across. You can see Scotland here for, from Iceland. And you can see the big, social, uh, this big, so, the, the big uh, economic cost, especially to the airlines, that this volcanic eruption caused. But as I already said, fortunately, no one was killed in this eruption. But this isn't always the case. So, um, oops, the, uh, the summer before last, uh, there were a couple of volcanoes that really hit the news, and they hit the news in really quite contrasting ways. So one of them was Fuego Volcano in Guatemala. Um, this is active all the time. It's uh, small explosions. I went to Guatemala um, uh, a few years back, um, and we drove past Fuego. We were going to work on a different volcano called Santiaguito. And in the time that it took us to drive past, there were two small explosions, uh, very, very beautiful, uh, just as we could see just from the road when we were driving. Um, I actually felt very humbled working in Guatemala. So um, in Guatemala, they have uh, th at least three or four permanently active volcanoes. They have tens of potentially active volcanoes, some of them with the potential for very, very large eruptions. Um, and they really have uh, kind of one part-time volcanologist to, to cover all of that. You know, it's very, uh, a very stretched resource. Um, in Oxford, we have no active volcanoes. We have no potentially active volcanoes. And we have two full-time volcanologists. So just that uh, gives you a kind of uh, an insight into the disparity of resource that we have. But anyway, Fuego Volcano, which goes off all the time, exploded more strongly and sent out pyroclastic flows down the sides of the mountain. So pyroclastic flows are the... It's like, uh, it's like when, when one of those... The eruption column collapses, and basically the hot ash and gas fall down under its own weight down the sides of the volcano. And this killed, uh, killed nearly 200 people. It was actually hard for them to get a census on exactly how many died. And you can see buried the... Uh, buried uh, many villages and communities. There's the volcano in the background. In, uh, in large amounts of dust and, and mud. Uh, and there are actually some rather alarming uh, videos on YouTube of people filming these pyroclastic flows as they came, and they're sort of filming them from a bridge, and then they sort of dawns on them, maybe this isn't a great idea, and they uh, start running away. Um, but this, as I say, this, was, this sort of hit the news, um, and one thing that is really I want to emphasise is that Fuego is active all the time. This was just a slightly larger, uh, and unfortunately fatal, <laughs> Uh, eruption. Another volcano that's active really all the time is the island of Hawaii, uh, of, of Kilo uh, the volcano of Kilauea on the island of Hawaii. So it's a big island, Hawaii, right in the middle of the Pacific Ocean, in the middle of uh, the Pacific Plate. And the same, uh, the same summer, last summer, basically, um, we're going to come back to Hawaii, but this, these new fissures started opening up. And this isn't unusual. Hawaii is spewing out lava, Kilauea is spewing out lava and gas Every, all the time. It's actually unusually quiet right at the moment, but uh, what was different here is these fissures were lower down on the volcano. They were lower down in the rift zone, and they start opening up in people's back gardens, essentially. So you can see here somebody's house with a very nice-looking swimming pool, um, and this lava flow is, is sort of encroaching on that. But the, uh, this, 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 uh, this type of eruption was much less explosive, um, but, uh, but also really uh, disruptive in terms of the lives and the livelihoods. So it didn't actually cause any fatalities, but it, uh, it, it cut off roads, people had to be evacuated, and actually the air quality in Hawaii was really impacted as well. 
But this ongoing, this current ongoing cycle of eruption, act, eruptive activity on Kilauea actually began in 1983. And so this is ongoing activity, this is everyday activity, and Kilauea and Fuego are pumping out gas and particles into our atmosphere every single day of the year. It's just sometimes that they hit the news when they do something slightly different like that. So these hazards are very, very important, but they're, they're, they're superimposed on, on a background of activity, a background of uh, everyday activity, if you like. Uh, I just wanted to show you, this is, uh, I wanted to talk a little bit about some of the work we've been doing on this sort of everyday volcanism. Uh, and I'm going to show you a short video clip of this uh, lava lake. This is actually uh, sunk back down now, but this is from 2017 at a volcano called Messiah in Nicaragua. I will show you this video clip of, of, the, of the lava lake. Then I'm going to show you some of the consequences. You'll see it's not very explosive activity. It's kind of roiling. It's almost like looking into a... Uh, it's very, very fluid magma. It's, um, you can see gas bursts coming out. There's a big gas flux coming off the lava lake. But it's not particularly uh, explosive. We're about 150 metres, 200 metres above the, the lava lake here. You can see these big clouds of gas coming out. You can see this very, very energetic activity here. Um, it, uh, it almost looks like I'm looking over a cliff into the sea, but of course it's sort of the sea on fire. Um, so that's, uh, that's the volcano that we went to, Nicar to Nicaragua to study. Um, this is actually a great uh, photo because this is so it's taken the, from the airport at Managua. The clue, obviously, is the plane. Uh, this was actually taken at 6.30 a.m. on my birthday, just as we were flying out of, uh, of, of Nicaragua. So I was facing the prospect of spending most of my birthday in Miami airport and feeling slightly grumpy about this. Um, and, uh, and then the, the weather was beautiful. I got, at least I got this beautiful view. So here's Messiah. That lava lake is just about in there that we just saw there. And you can see this gas plume going off downwind. It's slightly condensed in the early morning sun um, being blown off. And the, the thing about a volcano like uh, Messiah in Nicaragua, it's actually very, you can see it's relatively low altitude. And you can see there's other, other ground higher up downwind. So this makes it, uh, in the first instance, actually a really, a really interesting place to go and work because you can go and sit in the plume there and you can go and sit in the plume at these different distances away from the volcano and try and understand how the volcanic gases are getting changed. But it also means that the closest community, which is a community called El Panama, is actually only two kilometres from the vent. So El Panama is about, round about here on the old caldera rim. And what this means is that the local people really feel these, they feel the volcanic gases every day. They're being, um, they're being fumigated. And they, we went to the village and uh, collected some samples, but also spoke to the, to the local people. And we sort of recorded testimony. We, make, we made a short film as well. And they sort of say things like, the breeze burns my eyes and throat. Um, they've had to change. So this, this, this degassing crisis started in 1993, and they've had to change their agriculture. So they can no longer grow things like coffee. You can see there's some sort of evidence of burnt leaves from the acid gases of the, uh, of the volcano there. Um, they'd had to change to uh, grow things like pineapple and dragon fruits, which turned turn, turn out to be uh, much more resistant. But you can see this scrubland here downwind of the volcano, as opposed to the kind of cloud forest or, or, or uh, coffee plantations that tend to characterize this area. So volcanic, volcanoes and volcanic gases can really have a very profound uh, effect on the present day. Uh, visiting this village, one of the other really... We showed them that video I just showed you of the, uh, of the, of the lava lake. Uh, because it costs money to go into the national park to go and look at the volcano, uh, actually very few of the villagers have ever even looked into the mouth of the volcano. So they feel the effects of the volcano every single day. And they've never actually seen the source of the, uh, of the volcanic gas that they're experiencing, which I found quite a, uh, a sad thing, really. Uh, but, uh, but anyway, they were really, really excited about seeing that, that footage and also very excited about the, the video that we've made about their lives. So what I'm sort of hoping I'm getting across is that uh, volcanism on our present-day planet comes in a, a big spectrum of, of types, uh, and it really goes from these very um, these low explosivity types of everyday volcanism. Um, so this is this is Masara and Nicaragua again. This is uh, the picture a picture of uh, from Kilauea on Hawaii with the fissure opening up. 
This is actually some fumarol gassing. Gases just finding their way out through the cracks in the earth at Volcano Volcano. So it's obviously the original volcano, the original um, uh, down just near Sicily in, in Italy. So you've got this sort of very low explosivity going on here, and then we can sort of ramp up through the spectrum of explosivity and volcanic eruption. This is fire fountaining on Etna at night time. This is the same type of activity here in the daytime. Here's Fuego that we already saw with the pyroclastic flow coming down the side of the mountain. And then we can go up to, this is the Pinatuba eruption in 1991. And this is like a sort of more like a one in a hundred year type of event where a big cloud of gas and ash got punched up into our stratosphere and had profound effects for several, uh, se several years in terms of uh, a climate response and actually a, a cooling response in that case. But we also have styles of volcanic activity that our planet is capable of that we as human beings have not had uh, first-hand experience of, at least not had first-hand experience of in the historic era when we've been actually making records of these things. So one of those is super eruptions. I prefer to call them magnitude eight eruptions, but for some reason the press prefers super eruptions. Uh, so this is an example. This is Toba uh, caldera. It's actually a, a nested caldera, so it means it's several different calderas um, uh, together. So this is the last eruption was about 75,000 years ago. And uh, this is about 100 kilometers, just to give you a sense of scale. So these are a much larger type of volcanic activity than, than we've seen here. And actually, we, we have to piece together how that, um, how that eruption went from the geological record um, and from, from what other types of things like ice cores um, and other types of, of activity. But the um, other type of activity that we haven't seen in the, in the human era is uh, large igneous provinces. And this is a picture from North America. This is the Columbia River flood basalts. And that's the most recent of these large, large igneous provinces. And that's about 17 million years ago. So I'm going to come back to these. But my point I want you to take from this slide is that there's a whole range of different types of volcanic activity that we have on our planet. And that some of them, actually, we don't have first direct hand, first hand experience of. So we're having to kind of piece things together from the geological record. <laughs> and use what we can study to try and understand the effects uh, of the, these types of events. So let's uh, pause for a minute to think about what is in a volcanic plume. So I've actually already started alluding to some of the effects of things like sulfur dioxide, hydrogen chloride, which are, and hydrogen fluoride, which are the acidic gases. You remember those leaves being burned by acid rain, those coffee leaves we saw in Nicaragua. I've also alluded a bit to the effects of sulfur dioxide and sulfate aerosol in terms of thinking about the cooling after the Pinatuba eruption when, um, when, it, when, the, uh, when that got up into, the, up into the stratosphere. But in actual fact, the, the, most, uh, the, the, most prever the, the biggest um, amount of gas you get in a <laughs> volcanic plume is actually water, which isn't a huge surprise given... Uh, how prevalent water is on our planet. Um, and carbon dioxide is normally the second. Now, the thing about uh, water is we have a lot of water in our atmosphere already being evaporated off the oceans. We also have very variable amounts of water in our atmosphere as well. So the water in volcanic plumes doesn't tend to have a big effect. Um, it, doesn't, um, it doesn't really perturb that. And, we're, and the atmosphere is quite used to variable quantities. It can perturb a little bit if you get it up into the drier stratosphere. But that's, uh, that, that, that's, that's uh, the, main, the main perturbation that water can cause. Um, sorry. Um, but uh, carbon dioxide, I'm going to come back to in a second. Uh, also to mention that there'll be variable amounts of ash. So this depends where we were on that explosivity spectrum, if you like. So if you've got very explosive eruption, you'll have a lot of this ash fraction where you've got rock basically having been mechanically broken as, it, as the gases expand and it's come, it comes up through the conduit. Um, and we also have other particles in it. So I already mentioned the sulfuric acid particle. We also have little water droplets as well. And, of course, all these different components, this lovely cocktail of volcanic gases, can, uh, can end up interacting with each other. Um, some of these gases you can, you can be really, really quite aware of. So if you ever go to a volcanic area, the, the, the gas that you might get the most experience of is hydrogen sulfide. This smells like your, your classic bad egg smell. It's quite hard to miss. 
Um, and if you smell something that smells a little bit like burnt matches, that's, that's sulfur dioxide. So, you know, you can, you can go up and you can sniff the breeze and, uh, and work out what you've got there. I, 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 told, I said this once on a, a radio interview that I did, and uh, this, the guy just turned to me and went, are you like a connoisseur of volcanic gases? <laughs> he had this idea of me sort of, you know, sniffing like a fine burgundy or something. <laughs> oh, yes, uh, I love the smell of hydrogen sulfide in the morning. Um, <laughs> But, uh, but yes, I, I, I guess I suppose I am. I was really, I was really disappointed, though. I, I have to carry heavy equipment with heavy batteries in order to measure these different plume compo components. And it really would be nice if I could just go, oh, yes, that's a ratio of sulfur dioxide to uh, hydrogen sulfide of two, or actually be able to do something quantitative with it rather than having to carry all this heavy equipment. But, but sadly, I can't. So, so you get these, these different mixtures, anyway, of these, these cocktails of, uh, of different components in a volcanic plume. And, of course, when they, they go off downwind, they tend to, to react and do different things. Um, I like this photo. I was sort of showing this is Etna. This is uh, August 2001. This was taken by Clive Oppenheimer, my PhD supervisor from a, an aircraft. What I like about this is it shows you that even one volcano at the same time can, can give you a kind of array of different types of volcanic plume. So here we have a fissure eruption going on, a really nice ash-rich plume there. And then at the other end here, we have the, the northeast crater of Mount Etna with this just this white steam and sulfate aerosol plume going up like that with very little ash on it whatsoever. Uh, and then the southeast crater here is sort of somewhere in between. So we've got this kind of... Uh, that you can, you can just see how much variety, even in one photo, uh, from one volcano at one time, we get in terms of volcanic emissions. But of course, we're here today because it's the, uh, the year of carbon. And so I'm really going to focus on carbon um, from, in, from, um, from volcanoes just today. We, we, we obviously talk quite a lot about the greenhouse effect and rising temperatures in terms of man-made carbon. So volcanic carb carbon dioxide, of course, can have the same effects. I'm going to sort of come back to this, but of course the, the, the thing with our atmosphere, uh, especially at the moment, is we have a lot of carbon dioxide in our atmosphere. So in terms of a, 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 a small or even a large single volcanic eruption, the carbon dioxide they put out is, is relatively small compared to the global budget of carbon in our atmosphere already. So that's not a, a huge perturbation. But if we go through, we're going to explore this in the rest of the talk, if we go through times where we have more carbon dioxide in the atmosphere from volcanoes, it can cause the, very similarly to what we're potentially, what we're seeing right now in terms of uh, man-made global warming, can cause ocean acidification, of course, changes to rainfall as well. So it's the sort of same, um, the same menu, if you like, of effects, but just a, a slightly, a, a rather different cause. And in fact, one of the motivations sometimes for looking at very large carbon dioxide releases from natural sources is also to think about the future of our, our planet now in terms of the increasing carbon dioxide we, levels we see today. But actually, volcanic carbon dioxide can also be one of the good guys. We need some carbon dioxide in our atmosphere. We wouldn't want to remove it all because we need, to, we, we, we need an atmosphere. Our atmosphere is really, really vital to us. And actually, uh, volcanic carbon dioxide is part of um, something, uh, the, the long-term carbon cycle, which has been in operation for about the last, oops, the last 200, oh, <laughs> I'll get there in a second, it's the white button, don't press the black one there, <laughs> that blanks the screen, which is a very bad thing, um, for about the last 200 million years. So we have volcanoes around the world putting out carbon dioxide in those different types of activity and those different types of plumes that uh, we already talked about. So this can be explosive or, or non-explosive. Uh, non so that carbon dioxide ends up in the atmosphere. But carbon dioxide is a little bit soluble in water, a little bit soluble in rainwater. So it gets dissolved in clouds and rainwater and pulled down, making that rainwater slightly acidic. And that acidity then reacts with the rocks. There's the chemical reaction for people who, who, uh, who, who want to uh, uh, understand the, the full chemistry. Um, and basically gets tied up in these, in these carbonates that then run off and can eventually, some of them, end up in seawater. Once in the seawater, the carbonates can be used by, by bugs. Uh, that's about the extent of my biology, so apologies to any biologists in the, in the audience. Um, 
So it, uh, it gets used by different types of bugs, which have particularly been uh, prevalent in our system in the last 200 million years, and then can be sedimented out. And as long as the sea, the sea depths and chemistry are correct, then that can end up subducted uh, so uh, in the plate tectonics down inside the Earth again and changed and either stored in the deep Earth or taken up back through the volcanoes. Now, the clever thing about this is it's like a, a mini little thermostat. Um, so if the temperature of the planet goes up, what happens is, is that we get more evaporation off the surface of the oceans. We therefore get more rainfall. Um, we're big, hard to believe on a, uh, not hard to believe on a wet day like today. We get more, more rainfall. And also these chemical reactions, the increasing temperatures, make them, make them go just a little bit faster. And what that tends to do is to pull the carbon dioxide out of our atmosphere, which then allows more of the, uh, more of the infrared radiation to escape and cools the planet down. Um, so conversely, if, if, the, uh, if the planet cools down, then we end up with the uh, less evaporation, less precipitation, slightly slower reactions. And this means that the carbon dioxide from volcanoes can actually build up in the atmosphere. So it's, it's got a negative feedback in there. And it's allowed our planet to remain relatively stable over millions and millions of years. It allowed potentially uh, one, of the, one of the reasons that really complex life has been able to evolve. And if you, you don't have to go far to sort of see how, how important these types of balances can be. So our surface temperature is roughly about, our average surface temperature is roughly about 15 degrees Celsius. Our, one of our nearest neighbour, Mars, is about minus 55 degrees Celsius, which is considerably less pleasant um, for your summer holidays. Um, and there's a couple of reasons for this. One, it being further from the sun, so it would actually need more greenhouse gases in its atmosphere to keep it warm. But it's also much smaller than Earth. It's about a ninth of the mass. And so the interior cooled more quickly. And so uh, volcanism, we think, ceased a long time ago, or at least substantial volcanism ceased a long time ago. And this means that you don't have the same source of CO2 to basically maintain that atmospheric reservoir. And of course, you also don't have plate tectonics. It's a very, very different environment. Um, the other thing, of course, to mention is lower gravity and laxer magnetic fields. Both of those mean its atmosphere is also stripped off more, more readily. But in any case, we have a very different scenario with a very thin atmosphere here. So there's a couple, there's a couple of scientific questions that sort of come out of, there's many scientific questions that come out of looking at this sort of overall, uh, all overall scheme here. Um, but one of them is to think is actually we want to know sort of how much carbon dioxide is coming out of the, of the world's volcanoes. We want to try and understand what is this source term? What is normal behaviour in terms of our planet's carbon dioxide coming out? And actually, for carbon dioxide, that is really um, particularly tricky, unfortunately. Um, I'm going to go back to Kilauea now, so back, back to Big, uh, Big Island, Hawaii, right here. We imagine we're in the middle of a, the Pacific Ocean. It's probably rather nicer weather than it is in November in London. Um, but we're back on, on, on uh, Kilauea here. I'm just going to illustrate this by thinking about some of the activity on Kilauea before 2008. So things did change a bit in 2008. But if you went to Kilauea um, back in, in 2008, you could have visited several parts of the volcano that were active. So the most spectacular part of the volcano that was active was actually this area in the East Rift Zone, uh, this vent called Pu'u O'o, which often had a lava lake in it and often had these streams of molten lava flowing away from it like this. Um, just for reference, the, the area that was affected last, some before last by the volcanic activity is this area with plenty, where, where many people actually have their homes, which is down in this area in the lower east rift zone uh, down here. So we're, we're further up, people, there's, it's not particularly impacting on populations. There was the, 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 the flow field often would flow down like this and enter the sea, and there was some loss of uh, property uh, when, the, when the activity started. So that was probably, that's where the most spectacular activity was going on. Um, and there was a lot of gas emission associated with that. But the other place that people would visit would be the, the summit crater. This is um, the, uh, the old caldera here and the Halimaumau crater. This is believed to be the home of the goddess Pele. So the locals uh, think that this is where the volcano goddess Pele uh, um, basically lives. So when we went to work on Hawaii, we had a very moving ceremony where we had to make an offering to the goddess uh, to say thank you for letting us work on the volcano and uh, throw an offering into, into the crater here. 
So you can see there's a little uh, car park here for, for scale. Um, and there's a very nice lodge just there. This is an old crater here, and the Hawaii Volcano Observatory is just, just about there. Um, so the interesting thing, most of the sulfur dioxide and hydrogen chloride gas emissions were coming out here, but actually the plume here was relatively poor in carbon dioxide. Um, and you, you couldn't really see it because uh, it was uh, um, much harder to see. This is very kind of, you could, you could see a nice well-defined de plume coming off here, but actually there was a, a large area of diffuse carbon dioxide seeping out of the Earth in, in this area here at the summit crater and then some, some more round about there. Um, so it was like it was a diffuse, a lot of flux of carbon dioxide coming up here and it was very, very hard to see it and it was sort of seeping out through cracks in the earth or just through the, the soil itself. And the reason for this is because carbon dioxide is not very soluble in a magma. So we've got a molten rock coming up from deep within the earth. So this is deep in, uh, inside the, the mantle here and coming up into the crust. And you've got a molten rock, and as it, as it comes up, the pressure drops on that molten rock. And as the pressure drops, the gases within it get less soluble. So it's, it's like um, when you open your, your, your fizzy drink bottle, your Coke, or your uh, mineral water, or whatever, and the, 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 you get a, the gases start coming out as you, as you take that pressure off the, um, off, off, off the liquid there. So as, as the pressure decreases, as it comes up um, through the Earth's crust here, uh, and the first gas that comes out into the bubbles is the carbon dioxide. It's basically the least soluble in, in that magma. And so what that means at Hawaii is that actually there was a magma storage area right underneath this, this summit area here. This is, sort of, this is a slice sideways through the volcano. Um, and at about four kilometres underneath that summit area there, the, the magma was being stored, and a lot of the carbon dioxide had already come out of solution. It was already in gas bubbles. And it was finding its way out uh, um, of the Earth's crust, actually underneath this part here, rather than when the magmas were kind of pushed off down the East Rift to actually erupt at, uh, at Pu'u O'o. So what that means, that's a couple, of, a couple of things that I'll bring out now. The first thing that means is often the way that we understand as volcanologists the gas, what's going on in the gases here is to use crystals. So we used crystal, crystals of rock-forming minerals like olivine. And when these crystals grow, they can trap tiny little parts of the magma um, inside their structure. And when these, these rocks are then erupted, we can go and look at these melt inclusions. They're just little specks of volcanic glass captured within the crystal structure. And we can go and make measurements of these melt inclusions and actually understand what gases were trapped inside that magma at depth. Now, the problem with carbon dioxide is it's often gone into the bubbles before we get these crystals forming. So we don't get that information because it comes out so deep in the system. And the other problem that we have is because it comes out really deep in the system, it could be lost over enormous areas and it can be lost in ways that are really hard to spot. So it makes it really tricky for us to actually catch it all. So this is a photo taken in Yellowstone and you can see just in a few places you have this, these, these, these uh, fumaroles, these gassy manifestations of, uh, of gas coming out of the crust. But in between these, there'll also be a lot of gas coming out. And you can get a sense of the scale of this fumarole field. Um, in order to really understand how much carbon dioxide was coming out of that, you need to go and make measurements at each of those spots, at each of those positions. You kind of need to do a grid of measurements all across this area like this. And in fact, this is what I'm doing here in uh, East Africa. Um, sitting with some instrumentation. This is just, just a little sort of uh, cup that you put on the soil to see how much carbon dioxide is, is coming out. Um, so we're making some measurements here, and um, shortly afterwards, a, a bunch of uh, baboons started. Uh, they got a bit fed up. Uh, we were basically sitting exactly where they, they wanted to come and play. And I was working with a guy called Amdi, who's um, from southern Ethiopia, really great uh, local collaborator. And in southern Ethiopia, they have even more wildlife than you do in uh, this part. This is mid-Ethiopia, a Luto volcano. And I was getting very excited about these baboons, um, uh, as you would. And Amdi was a bit dismissive. And I sort of worked out that he, he was very used to having baboons around. So it was a little bit like somebody coming to the UK and getting very excited about pigeons. So, um, so I, I, he, was, he was a bit... And I, these, more and more of these baboons were kind of 
coming up around us. And I was just, do, do baboons ever attack you? Oh, no, no, they never attack anybody. Um, but they got kind of more and more uh, closer into us and were kind of shouting at us and things. Eventually, even Andy said, there are, there are about 100 of them by this stage. Should we move on? Let's, let's go do a measurement over there. Oh, that, that looks like a very good place to go and do a measurement. Let's go and do that. <laughs> So, uh, so yes, this is a, this is this, this. I'm smiling here, but it, it soon got a little bit more edgy. Um, so yes, it's, it's, it's not always the volcanoes that are the danger in the fieldwork. Um, you also have to make measurements at hot springs, and this is my friend uh, Giovanni Ciardini making a measurement in a fumarole. So it's quite a complicated measurement scenario. Um, and this is just to, to give you an example of this. This is Africa. Hopefully, uh, uh, spotted that. But as uh, many of you will know, the con uh, the, um, basically the continent of Africa is rifting, it's tearing apart um, in, down this sort of uh, large area um, of East Africa here, so the East African Rift, we call it. And lots of this area is degassing carbon dioxide. That really is a huge challenge. So we've just been looking at this kind of, this relatively small footprint here. A US team have been looking at this small footprint here. And you can see these are our these these are our four survey sites. So we're 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 trying to cover a really large area. Um, these are our survey sites here. These these circles are our measurement points. All the triangles give you an idea of where the volcanoes are. So we're we're trying to, given the area that we need to cover with these putting this cup on the ground to see how much gas is coming out. Uh, it's really a huge challenge to start sort of putting those, those, those spatially dispersed, so they're, they're measurements that we can only make in certain places, to think of a way of actually scaling them up in a sensible way to this entire area of East Africa. And you've got some really systematic changes going on along here as well. So it's, it's a big challenge. <laughs> and that's not even mentioning the baboons. Um, but people are putting together. This is actually hot off the press. This is just a, a recent paper here. Um, and we are doing a better and better job at, at putting together these measurements of carbon dioxide at different volcanoes. And now you can see we're putting, this is the, the sort of latest estimates of mid-ocean ridge degassing hotspots like Hawaii, so the volcanoes that are not arc, uh, subduction zone related uh, or mid-ocean ridge related. Continental rifts like East Africa, continental arcs um, like South America, Central America, where you've got subduction zones. And then tectonic degassing as well, which is where you actually have things like in the Himalayas, where you have uh, continental collisions going on. So we're doing better and better at putting these together, and this, the scale is uh, basically billion tons on, on this axis here. Uh, the thing I want to point out, this is when you add all these together, you get this total, total outgassing uh, value here. Um, and I just want to point out, because I get this asked this question a lot, uh, if we look at this is this is what the sort of current budgets for anthropogenic emissions are, we're still at least uh, at least one order of magnitude lower in term, terms of volcanic degassing than for anthropogenic emissions. Um, and this number has gone up a bit over the last few after over the last few years, but we think we're doing a much better job now. And I don't think we're going to get an order of magnitude and get uh, and get mankind off the off the hook in terms of our emissions. So the other question I want to address in the in the time remaining is what about what does but this is this is your I mean sort of that was about the present day, but does this flux change significantly uh, over geological timescales? And if we go back to this um, this 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 part here, there's a little clue perhaps in what's coming, because uh, this is the Chicxulub impact. This is the carbon dioxide emission estimated for that. So that is a a large uh, bolide, a lot, that's the impact that is around the time of the demise of the dinosaurs. So a large, uh, a large impact to hitting our planet near Mexico. But this is also the large igneous province uh, flux that people have estimated. And note the very, very big error bar. There should probably be a big, uh, bigger error bar on that one as well. Uh, but there's very, very large, um, these very potentially large fluxes that actually overwhelm the average day-to-day -day background degassing flux, if you like. So what are, I, we, I mentioned large igneous provinces at the beginning. What are these large igneous provinces? This is the photo I showed, showed you earlier of the Columbia River flood basalts, about, which is the most recent of these events. So you can see a, a car and a house uh, or a barn just there for scale. So these are these, these massive stacks of lava flow upon lava flow upon lava flow upon lava flow. Um, 
Uh, and um, just to give you an idea of the sort of area these can cover, this is the Deccan Traps now in India, which is a slightly larger one than the Columbia River. So this is, uh, this is the uh, subcontinent of India here. And this is the sort of footprint of the Deccan Traps on the subcontinent here. And this is just the subaerial part of it. This is a slightly more detailed, um, a slightly more detailed uh, um, map here to show you with, uh, with, the, with the scale as well. And again, you see this is a very famous photo, of this pile upon pile of, mag uh, of magma, of, of basaltic, mainly lava flows. So these events um, are absolutely huge, but they also last a very long time. So the Deccan Traps is about half a million cubic kilometres. So just to give you a sense of scale, a cubic kilometre of magma would cover um, Greater London, so including, you know, Outlaw, Croydon, that type, type of footprint, would cover Greater London to about 60 centimetres of depth. Um, so this was about a million, a million of those, or half a million of those, put out over about uh, a million years, the maximum activity. Um, and then they put out huge quantities as well of, of gas. So we often estimate sulfur dioxide because it's easier to estimate than carbon dioxide. And the surface of our planet is peppered with these, the, these the deposits from these large igneous provinces. So, you know, the geological time scale has been peppered by them as well. So these are, the blue ones are submarine, uh, oceanic plateaus, um, and the red ones are the continental flood basalts. So here's the Deccan traps again, including the, including the, uh, the submarine component, the, the component that's uh, submarine. Um, and I just want to, there's the Columbia River over here in, in North America. And I just want to draw your attention to two other. Uh, the central, uh, the camp, the Central Atlantic Magmatic Province that's actually been ripped apart by plate tectonics and is now on three separate continents here. Um, and also the Siberian traps uh, up here uh, in Siberia, as you might expect. Um, and if you ever, if you ever have uh, occasion to fly from, from London or from Europe, over to Tokyo on a daytime flight and you manage to get a window seat, do take a look out because it, it's absolutely stunning if you get a clear day, this <coughs> massive area of that stacked topography of lava flow upon lava flow upon lava flow. So we've never seen this type of activity. We have to go to these places and try to piece together what the, t what the eruptions uh, look like. And uh, people go, we, one of the sort of uh, big challenges actually is working out um, you can see the separate eruption units, but actually working out how long the gaps were between them. But the other thing we can do is, go, is also study analog eruptions, so study more recent eruptions. So the most recent of these, which, which had the advantage of being in the satellite era, was the 2014 to 2015 Holler eruption. It was kind of them to, uh, to have a, a volcano erupt that was easier to pronounce, I felt. Um, the Holler eruption in Iceland. Uh, and this is a picture of the type of activity you have. So, so as you see, it's a bit like that Hawaiian activity. It's a sort of fissure of fire, um, but spewing out huge amounts of gas. Um, this is a, a wonderful photo, and also as another example of how you can make a volcanic plume more spectacular. So this time you put the northern lights in the background. Um, but, uh, but, but this time it has absolutely nothing to do with the volcanic activity. But this was actually about, only about a cubic kilometre of lava and only lasted for about six months. So it's, it's, a, it's, a, order, it's, it's a million times smaller, if you like, than the, or half a million times smaller than the Deccan traps. So um, I just in the last few minutes, wanted to go through sort of you know, how we piece these massive volcanic events. How do we put them together with other things going on in the geological record? So this is a representation of part of the geological record. This is present day here. And then we're going basically back 300 million years in Earth history. And what we have on this axis up here is, is species diversity, if you like, the number, of, uh, tax, the number of species, the number of taxonomic families. And this is just a very, very broad illustration of how this has varied over geological time. So the way that evolution has worked, the way that species change has worked has not been regular and it's been, it goes through these, these big turnovers, these big mass extinction events. Uh, and there are, they're sometimes called the big five, but only five of, uh, three of them are in this part of the geological time scale. So you can see here you've got the M Permian, this massive dive in, in, um, massive dive in species diversity. Uh, and then the N Triassic here, uh, a slightly smaller dive in species diversity, and then the, the N Cretaceous up here. Um, 
the way that we know about this, I always like to put this slide in, is of course through, through uh, looking at the biology recorded in the geological record. So this is just a sort of how, how we would go and look at a, an outcrop or, a, or some core that we've recovered. And we're really, really lucky in the UK. We have some of these rocks really on our doorstep. So this is a photo of, uh, from Lyme Regis, um, which actually records the end Triassic uh, mass extinction. And you can go and stand on the, the ammonite beds here. And what happens is you have pre-extinction, you have lots of lovely uh, biology plants, animals going on there. And then extinction events happens, you get this kind of blank bit. So in the, in the geological record or less, less species there. And often this, this horizon here is recorded by the last occurrence of a particular fossil. And then we enter the recovery phase and then the post-extinction phase. We're back to a, a, a nice diverse ecosystem, but it's a different diverse ecosystem to here. And as I said, you can just go down to Lyme Regis and you can turn right um, and, uh, and you can basically walk through a mass extinction. It's, it's, it's sort of, uh, we take our undergraduates there. It's, um, it's amazing. We've also got some other wonderful locations like St. Aldrew's Bay and Somerset. Um, but we can also look and see what's going on in other ways. So we can look at the biology, but we can also look at things like changes in the carbon cycle. And one of the ways that we do this is by looking at carbon isotopes. So carbon isotopes, carbon has... Uh, uh, you, could, you could basically look at the ratio between uh, carbon atoms of different masses. So they have different number of neutrons. Uh, and if you get changes in that, you'll basically say, you can basically uh, surmise that there are changes in the carbon cycle on the planet. <laughs> So this is just some examples from Chinese sections, though, well, they're currently in China, at the M Permian mass extinction. And I'm just going to draw your attention to the Mishan one here. And you've got the, mar the marine and land extinction marked here. You can see it in terms of the green line is species richness. So you can see this, uh, this, this green line that I was explaining there. And what you can see very particularly with the marine extinction is as the species uh, line dives down, so do the carbon isotopes. There's a big perturbation in terms of the carbon cycle. And lo and behold, the, um, the, these three big mass extinction events, and there's lots, there's lots more smaller events as well, which I'm not going to have time to go into today, line up with three of these large igneous provinces. So the end Cretaceous lines up with the Deccan, the end Triassic with the Central Atlantic Magmatic Province and the end Permian with the Siberian here. Now, the Deccan Traps and the, the end Cretaceous is often the one that people have heard about. So that's, uh, obviously that was uh, associated with the demise of the dinosaurs, which is, is why it often gets, uh, gets, gets a lot of attention. And I've already talked to you through the Deccan Traps, but it's worth remembering we also had the Chicxulub Impactor coming in here. Um, and there's some wonderful cartoons, if you want to uh, get another diversion, should you require it, uh, online. So this is what I pulled out, which is uh, about the, the check slip impact, say, hey, hey, Arthur, check it out, a shooting star, that's a sure sign of good luck, my friend. So unfortunately, it wasn't so much good luck for the dinosaurs, which is something to, uh, to remember. But anyway, so that, that there is a complexity here, and it's an interesting thing to ponder, is would, would we have had such a large mass extinction event if just the Deccan had been going on? And there's some really interesting questions about that, which I'm not going to have time to go into today. Of course, here's the alternative hypothesis, which is Tyrannosaurus rex, right next to a volcano, probably being directly killed by a rock falling on his head which uh, isn't exactly how we, we, we kind of uh, conceptually think about it. But uh, anyway, this is, the artists had some fun here. Um, if we go look at the camp, now the Central Atlantic Magmatic Province, then we had about 76% of all species lost. Uh, these were slightly less complicated species than the dinosaurs, so things like these sort of crocodile-like mastodontosauruses and brachiopods. Um, and, uh, and uh, but about, uh, it was associated with this, this very large area here. This, you can see it traced out. These are the, the parts where it's come to the surface. And these are the, the, sub, the, the stuff that stayed in the crust, we think. So the, the, the large footprint of the Central Atlantic Magmatic Province. I had quite an interesting, talking about dinosaurs and mass extinction events, and this one not being about, particularly about dinosaurs, I had quite an interesting public engagement. Uh, we, had, we, we published a paper on the end Triassic mass extinction and the link with the Central Atlantic Magmatic Province. And I was invited to go on Radio 5 Live to talk to Adrian Childs about this paper. Um, the unfortunate thing about the, paper, about the conversation was is that Adrian Childs really wanted to talk about T-Rex. Um, T-Rex was alive about here. 
And I really wanted to talk about the end Triassic mass extinction of the Central Atlantic Magmatic Province. So the conversation wasn't the most functional conversation in the world. It, it roughly went me going, so yes, there was a, uh, there was a, a really, really, a series of really, really large uh, volcanic eruptions that caused a mass extinction event about 200 million years ago. And Adrian Child goes, all right, good. What's it got to do with T-Rex? Um, and me going, well, it really doesn't have very much to do with T-Rex. It was about 100 million years uh, too early. All right, uh, do you think it might have cleared the way for T-Rex? <laughs> Well, yes, I suppose in a very broad sense, it could have cleared the way for T-Rex. OK, thank you very much, Professor Mather from University of Oxford. And now to the news. So, um, so yeah, it was... Uh, <laughs> I didn't quite get my message across, I didn't feel, but I guess, uh, I, I, I guess, uh, I guess uh, there was some relationship with T-Rex. So, yes, yeah, some people do say it cleared the, the... This mass extinction here cleared the way for the dinosaurs. It doesn't all have to be about dinosaurs. Uh, but then actually the very largest mass extinction in the record is the M. Permian, where we see 96% of all species lost. Uh, as I say, that's associated with this large area, this large um, Siberian uh, magmatic province up here. So one of the issues with this is that to get these sorts of mass extinction events, it's really about how much gas we put out. We saw this perturbation in the carbon cycle from the carbon isotopes. And one of the big mysteries we have, I'm not going to really dwell on this slide too much, the really, what I want you to take home from this is that one of the big mysteries we have is we, we, we're not really yet confident that we see a way that these large igneous provinces can get enough carbon dioxide out into the atmosphere. We don't think there's actually enough carbon dioxide in the magmas that we see erupted at the surface in order to account for the carbon isotope excursion or actually to account for the, the, the climate perturbations and the perturbations to the, the uh, ecosystems that we're seeing. Um, and so really this leaves us with an open question. So if there are any, uh, any students in the room, uh, we haven't got this all sewn up. There are plenty of open questions yet. This, uh, this is just to kind of highlight one of them. So we're looking for different ways uh, that large igneous provinces might have put carbon dioxide into the atmosphere as well as having it in their magmas. I just want to sort of talk about two. Um, so the first one, this is a sort of side cut through um, the large igneous province. And you can see here are the magmas being erupted in that stack-like fashion on the Earth's surface and putting carbon dioxide out. But you can also see there's a lot of magma sitting here in the Earth's crust. And some of it's just sitting here in the Earth's crust quite shallow. And some of it might be deeper, but interacting with organic-rich sediments. So two of our theories at the moment is that because of what I said about, do you remember underneath Hawaii, underneath Kilauea, that the, the carbon dioxide was coming out relatively deep? Actually, maybe we don't need all the magma to get to the surface to get carbon dioxide finding its way out into the Earth's atmosphere. And in fact, there's a recent study looking at my favorite, the end Triassic mass extinction, nothing to do with T-Rex, um, and, uh, and basically looking at all these, these intrusive, these, these rocks that are left behind inside the crust rather than being put out onto the surface. And the other thing might be is that if these, um, these, these hot magmas are coming into contact with organic-rich country rocks or limestone, it's basically, I don't know if any of you remember doing these sort of experiments at school where you heat up calcium carbonate uh, powder and it turns the, the lime water milky because it's giving off carbon dioxide. But this sort of thing could be happening at massive scale underneath large igneous provinces. And there's some evidence, so this is from the Karoo Basin in South Africa, where there's an example of a large igneous province, of these kind of blisters, if you like, that are burst of carbon dioxide coming up from this type of activity here. So we've really still got a lot of open questions about these interactions between uh, large igneous provinces and the geological record. Um, and I'm going to leave it there, and I put some concluding remarks up there, which I shall leave you to read. But I hope I've convinced you that... Uh, we can learn a lot both in terms of the present day, uh, present day cycles, uh, but also in terms of Earth's geological past from, um, from studying volcanism today. Thank you very much. Um, I think we have time for a few questions, if anybody would like to ask one. This gentleman down here, straight off the bat. Thank you. What's up? Microphone. If you take long-term changes like the change to a colder um, Earth with the growth of Antarctica from 34 million years ago and the warmer period before, 
Uh, do you think that's related to a change in level of volcanism? Um, possibly, but I mean, I, there's a lot of other stuff going on. I mean, uh, there's a lot of other stuff going on at the same time, and this is part of a, a sort of part of a much wider balanced system. So I'm certainly not meaning to give the impression that volcanism accounts for every single fluctuation in, in the Earth system. It is just interesting that when we see these large scale, um, when, we, when we see the, these large scale episodes, and there, I, I've only concentrated on three, I could pick out many of others like the uh, PET, the, uh, the Permian ESC, the, the, the thermal maximum, um, the PETM is also like that's when you've got the North Atlantic Igneous Province going off. So there's some smaller, there's some smaller perturbations that also seem to be associated. But I think, you are, I think that a key thing to remember is the state that the planet is in at the time that you get the large Igneous Province occurring is really, really crucial. Uh, and that's not just about ice house, uh, greenhouse, it's also about like, the configuration of the continents as well. So I wouldn't, want to, I wouldn't want you to go away from this and say, I think I was trying to say that every single change in the Earth system is driven by volcanism. Volcanism is part of uh, a much richer tapestry in terms of the feedbacks and drivers in, in terms of uh, uh, plant tree evolution. How far can you predict future volcanic activity? And, and I mean, it's a big question, but can you do that? Um, well, we know when something's changed. We know when something becomes restless, if it's monitored well. So not all volcanoes around the world uh, are well monitored. Uh, and one of the interesting things that, that I think is, is really pushing that particular field forward is satellite measurements at the moment. We're really pushing out what we can do with the satellites, both in terms of looking at the gases coming out, but also, the, uh, also um, in terms of the changes in shape that you get associated with some uh, types of volcanic activity. So we can often tell if something's changed. If we've got, let's, pre let's, let's pretend we've got every volcano in the world perfectly monitored. So you can see changes in seismicity, and you can ch see changes in, in uh, gas emissions and things like that. But there are still some volcanic eruptions that seem to initiate very, very deep, and that is a real challenge. So the Kalbuka eruption a few years back, there was, there was seismic monitoring on that volcano, and they still only got... Um, it, was, it was half day, I think, they had of warning from that. Um, there just there seem to be some volcanic systems where where something is driven from very very deep and that does pose a, pose a challenge. The other things that are very challenging are things like the the Fuego uh, volcano, which is active all the time. And so as I said, you know it it would regularly do these small explosions. So you're not trying to say is there going to be another explosion? Yes, there's definitely going to be another explosion, probably several today. The challenge then is which part of that if you kind of imagine. Um, you know, a bell curve of, of, of explosion size. Where in the bell curve is that explosion going to fall? And if it falls up here, then that's really, that, that could have potentially deadly consequences. So they, did, they, knew, they knew it was edging into that higher end of the bell curve, if you like, but they didn't know that the next one was going to be so deadly. So um, the, we, can, we, can certainly make, we, we can certainly see it make some efforts, and we're making bef better efforts all the time, but there is, there is still a real challenge in terms of many different types of systems. I could, I could give a whole lecture on this, to be honest, um, in, in terms of just the, the way that we know about them, in, in a way, and the types of things that you need to know to make that prediction. And, of course, then there's a whole human element on top of it as well, which is very fascinating in the abstract and, uh, and can be uh, less so when you're on the ground. Thank you. Uh, talking about the long-term carbon cycle that you showed, it showed actually uh, recycling through volcanoes, which I took from the subduction zone. But obviously, things like Hawaii, as I understand it, come from deep mantle plumes. Does that mean that there is actually a reservoir of carbon coming from deeper layers, which is being introduced into the mantle, indeed, into the biosphere and, and all that, which is increasing the amount of carbon that's there? Um, well... There's certainly carbon dioxide coming out of the mantle rather than purely being subducted through subduction zones because of what you say about Hawaii not being a subduction zone volcano. 
uh, most of the world's volcanoes or subaerial volcanoes are, subduct are subduction related. Um, the I th whether things there's there's sort of quite a bit there's quite a bit written about whether things are in balance or out of balance. Um, so I think that the some people think that the the carbon going down into subduction zones is sort of perfectly recycled in terms of coming back out. In which case, then you would say, oh, well, then the suggestion would be that. But but actually, you you maybe don't need that much not to get uh, you you don't need that much uh, getting into the deep mantle to then feed into volcanoes like Hawaii. And there is evidence that ocean islands like Hawaii, um, the plumes are actually triggered from old subduction zones that uh, so that that ended up going very very deep down, and then that that the, there's some sort of evidence of that. Very very ancient subduction in those. We haven't we haven't got we haven't got that um, entirely worked out. But I think that the, um, the 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 real difficulty is that we're often trying to kind of compare one very big un, one number with big error bars on it with another number with very big error bars on it. So when you're trying to look at sort of slightly more subtle imbalance balance discussions, it, it can be quite a challenge. But yes, there certainly there certainly is there certainly is um, there certainly is carbon in the mantle, absolutely, and some of it is finding its way out. Thank you so much, Tamsin, and thank you everyone for coming. Um, just before I let you go, I, I really hope that you enjoyed this lecture. And before we thank Tamsin one more time, um, I'd just like to raise that it costs the society, uh, a charity, over £10,000 a year to run these public lectures, um, which engage a really, engage a really broad audience. Um, and if, with key themes uh, all around earth sciences. If you'd like to make a donation to support us running these lectures, please do so in the collection box on your way out of the building. And I'd really love it if you could join me in thanking Tamsin very much one more time. Thank you.